How do what concerns people so much about spray foam insulation is they just have absolutely no clue about what's in it as far as chemistry is concerned. And to them, it's the boogeyman. Today, I'm gonna to get into that and I'm gonna answer the question, is the stuff that you get in the can the same as the stuff that the guy spraying out of the truck is doing for you? My name is Mike. I am the owner of Spray Jones. I am a spray foam contractor in Canada. I've had 25 years in the spray foam industry, the last 20 spraying as a contractor. I've had tens of thousands of jobs done and I produce a lot of content on the internet to help people just like you understand spray foam insulation and get educated on their projects about using this product and seeing how amazing it is for their builds. What is the chemistry of spray foam insulation? It's not that complicated. There's five main ingredients that go into it. Obviously it's a little more complex than that, but if we're gonna bake the cake, there's five main things that we need to get into it, And that's what I'm gonna cover here today. Number one is where we get the word polyurethane from. Urethane and poly, that's the giveaway is poly. Poly means many, many chains of molecules. So the molecular level, there's all these chains that are linking together to form a synthetic oil, a synthetic plastic. The plastic is derived from petroleum based. However, it is made in a lab and these linking chains are forming a strong bond and they are actually thermal set chains, which means that once they have linked together and formed the many components, they do not go back into a liquid state. So you're used to taking a piece of uh, so-called styrofoam, putting heat to it, putting a flame to it and watching it melt and drip. That's not what polyurethane is going to do. Polyurethane is going to burn and char and it is going to combust, but it is not going to revert back into a liquid state. Something that you can do for me if you're liking this type of content and you've been watching my videos is join thinksprayfoam.com. This is where people go that want to learn more about spray foam insulation. They're either installing it, having it received, they have to inspect it, they're dealing with it in their day-to-day -day lives, and they want to know more about it without all the trolls that they get normally online. I have a private online community at thinkspraypoam.com where you can continue the dialogue with me and other spray foam people that are in the biz and know what they're talking about, that want to get better, want to make you better, and want to have you welcome. So come join today. It helps support this kind of work. There are five main components that go into making any one spray polyurethane foam, and those are going to be simply a polyol that is going to make the plastic, that is the plastic, it's a synthetic oil that has been made in the lab. And that is going to be the building blocks, the many blocks that are going to link as chains. The second is going to be a blowing agent. We don't want that plastic to just sit flat. We want it to be cellular. Therefore, we need something to puff and create cells. That gas is going to open the cells up and then be trapped in there to be an insulator. So there needs to be some type of a blowing agent. In closed cell foam, we're using a fluorocarbon. In an open cell foam, we're using water. In each of those states, it stays liquid. And to until enough heat is built up to do a phase change where we convert it from a liquid to a gas and that's where the cells are then puffed into kind of like blowing bubbles in, in chocolate milk or what have you the milk is the polyol and the blowing agent is you pushing air through the straw to form the bubbles. This is all controlled by a catalyst and a catalyst is setting, it's the gas pedal for slow or fast. And the reason that you need to speed things up and slow them down is there's different temperatures. You got hot Arizona, Texas summers, and you've got cold Alaska, Canadian winters. Obviously when we're using heat to convert from a liquid to a gas, we don't wanna use that heat to warm the substrate up. So a catalyst is going to control the speed of the initial reaction and the catalyst is matched with how much blowing agent and it's all done in the lab. We don't do any of it in the trailer. Surfactant is going to be added. That's going to just form the type of cells, the shape of the cells, how resilient and strong the cells are. So we can make a very strong foam or we can make a flex foam or we can make a rigid foam or a very high density foam. That's going to design it that way. And then finally, the last thing is the fire retardants that are put into it. And this is a bit of a controversial subject. Sometimes people think that fire retardants and shouldn't be in foams and that we should leave them natural. And I can attest to the fact that no, you don't want to do that. You want to have fire retardants in the plastics and even in the woods that are around you. Therefore, if combustion breaks out and things start to be igni ignited, that you are limiting smoke development, limiting flame spread, you're limiting the ability for combustible materials to build heat and then spontaneously self-ignite. And that's going to give you more exit time out of the building. And it means 
occupant safety. So these are the main components that go into the foams. Chemistry of foam is designed in the lab. We don't do any of the designing or experimentation. There is no experimentation. That's all done in the lab by the manufacturers. They're going to blend. They're going to create a product. They have a profile and they are going to design it. Whether we want a two pound density foam or a three pound foam for roofing or whether we want a four pound foam for panels or whether we want a half a pound foam for filling a wall cavity. They're going to design the product and the polyols to give us the performance that we want. Now, what do we mean by pounds per cubic foot, a two pound foam, a three pound foam? This is a way of rating. If we took a square cube of foam, any foam, and we measured it one foot squared, cubed, and we put placed it on a scale, it would weigh what? One pound, two pound, three pound, four pound, right? So it's a way of measuring the density of the cell structure. A cell structure is the amount of voids. The fewer amount of cells that you have, have, or the more coarseness of the cells means the more voids and pockets that you're going to have. So there's a balance between having a product that is incredibly dense with very few pockets, but is incredibly strong versus a product that is strong and resilient, but has fewer pockets within it. Industry standard for most residential, commercial, and industrial insulating is to use a two pound per cubic foot. And that product is going to weigh anywhere from 1.8 pounds to 2.1, 2.2 pounds per cubic foot. We rate a product for coverage based on board feet, similar to how a drywaller would speak and that they would go into a measurement of one inch of material given a square foot. We call that a board foot. So the entire system design, whether it's half a pound per cubic foot, two pounds per cubic foot, three pounds per cubic foot and up is all designed. It's in the drum. You buy the system that you want. The formulation is there just like buying paint. It's blended from the manufacturer. The installer is just installing it on site with the spray gun to the design parameters and boundaries already preset by the manufacturer. No experimentation or customization is happening on the job site. Can foam can be used to touch up, add to, modify, improve, enhance, closed cell, open cell spray foam. The cell structure can be at times very comparable, but it is a DIY product, a single component, meaning two components aren't needing to mix. It's coming out of the can like shaving cream when it's depressurized and it's taking moisture from the air and curing it. Now, can foam is a good tool in the toolbox. It's needed for tight areas, compact areas, you just cannot use a high pressure spray gun to get the foam into all of the cracks and crevices that exist in commercial and residential construction. And that's why we use a single component foam to fill gaps that we just cannot get the high pressure spray. The final way that foam is installed, both for open cell and closed cell, is that the drums arrive you pick the formulation, the speed of the formulation and the type of formulation, whether it's a three pound roofing foam, a half a pound per cubic foot or a two pound foam, you're buying a drum that has that formulation already designed into it. Just like buying a pail of paint, a different color is a different pail. There is a proportioning machine that is going to draw the material out from the drum to the back of the proportioner. It's gonna pressurize it. It's gonna heat it up to initiate the chemical reaction. It's gonna push that pressurized warmed fluid into a heated and insulated line. That's gonna deliver it to the spray gun. The spray gun is going to be pulled and the products, the two products, which are separate inside the gun are finally going to be allow to meet through ports and it's going to swirl, it's going to mix and it's going to spray out under its own pressure. The spray gun is then shut off when you let the trigger go and then some type of purging material, compressed air or a fluid is going to be blown through the gun to clean the mixed foam out so that the gun is ready for the next trigger pull and it's not plugged up with foam like your straw is on a single component. So the spray foam installer can turn his pressures up and down, he can turn his temperatures up and down, but that's just to customize what he needs for the day. Temperatures responding to a hot day, a cool day, and pressures depending on wide open areas versus tight areas. You don't want spray foam blowing back in your face if you're in a tight area so you can turn the pressure down. The installer is not at that point customizing the material or changing its density or changing the physical properties of the foam. That's all done in the lab with the formulation and the blend. That's delivered into drums in the truck. So if you need to change out from one foam to the next, you're gonna have to get the barrels out and put the, the correct ones in. Most of the equipment nowadays is one-to-one. -one. 
and it can spray a multitude, four or five or six different products, and they just change out the barrels and away they go. If you like this content, I encourage you to check out thinksprayfoam.com. That is my private online community for learning more about spray foam and connecting people that deal with it, install it, have to work with it. That's a community we can all get together and share information, talk, learn from each other, and not have to deal with trolls. Now I encourage you, like chapters in a book, to learn more about foam. Check out the other spray foam videos that I have on hiring a contractor, 20 good points, or top five mistakes that are made on site by the spray foam contractor and you and how to avoid them. Start to learn the other things that I've got out there. Check out the information that's there and continue your spray foam education. I'll look for you in the next video.